Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the educational session for this afternoon. My name is Lynn Vardy. I'm the Assistant Deputy Minister for Traffic Safety Services in Alberta for Alberta Transportation and Economic Corridors. I'm also Alberta's CCMTA Board of Directors representative. I will be your moderator for today's second session. Just a reminder, we are videotaping the educational sessions and they will be online shortly. Feel free to stand up and wave if you want people to recognize you. The following presentation will be approximately 90 minutes and we will open the floor to questions after each presentation. The session today will provide you with information and insights on understanding labor market challenges in trucking and identifying opportunities for increased collaboration. To, this, to, to discuss this topic, we are fortunate to have four very esteemed panelists. Melanie Vanstone, Craig Fawcett, Mike Million, and Jonathan Blackham. Melanie will start us off on the discussion. Melanie joined Transport Canada in November 2019 as Associate Director General, Multimodal and Road Safety Programs, and was appointed Director General in April 2022. In this role, she is responsible for the development and implementation of federal regulations and policy in support of road and commercial vehicle safety in Canada. Before joining Transport Canada, Melanie worked at Innovation, Science and Economic Development Canada, where she was responsible for policies and programs for federal investments in research. Please join me in welcoming Man Melanie Vanstone. Thank, thank you very much, um, and thank you for that introduction, uh, Lynn. It is really exciting to be here at the annual meeting. Of course, I'm here as a board member of CCMTA and, and very proud to be in that role, um, but also really excited to be here with colleagues on this panel today to talk about an issue that we're very, very interested in at Transport Canada, which is, uh, of course, the issue of labor shortages. Um, before I start my presentation, I, I do would like to do a brief uh, land acknowledgement. So I would like to acknowledge that, since we're in the city of St. John's, I acknowledge that the island of Ukta Homguk, or Newfoundland, is the unceded traditional territory of the Beotuk and Mi'kmaq people. So, uh, now I have to make sure I'm one hand, one in the other. All right, here we go. I'm gonna start with a bit of a broader context around labor shortages across the transportation sector. Um, within my group, I, I actually, you know, my title is kind of this long title, and it's multimodal and road safety programs. So I also ha I have teams that look at cross-cutting issues for the transportation sector, and, and this is one of them. So in the broader context, we are seeing that um, there are acute labor shortages across the transportation sector that are just projected to grow in the coming years. This, of course, includes trucking, but also aviation pilots and mechanics, marine engineers and seafarers. And um, shortages right now, of course, in the trucking sector are, are among the most acute. And there are some numbers on that slide, and, and those are projected shortages in the sector. Um, so if you see the number of a shortage of 55,000 workers, you know, sort of between now and, and looking toward 2035, that's a, that's a pretty stark figure. Um, from our view at Transport Canada, we really are concerned because labor shortages threaten health, safety, and the economy. Um, it's especially a concern for Indigenous, Northern, and remote communities that are most dependent on transportation for, for essential goods. Um, and of course, Labor shortages are not unique to transportation uh, and other sectors are competing uh, for many of the same skilled workers. So the thing about impacts, the thing about labor shortages in the transportation sector is that they have a very widespread negative impact across the Canadian economy. 
um, with approximately 4.3 billion in direct and indirect costs across Canada. Um, and so that's three times uh, higher than the direct cost alone within the transportation sector. Um, and that's, you know, that results in cascading impacts on other sectors that rely on transportation like agricultural, agricultural natural resources, tourism, and manufacturing. So when we look at this, you know, we've identified a series of different barriers to recruitment and retention of workers in the transportation system. And again, I'm still talking very much at kind of a broad cross-cutting level. Um, so uh, one of the ones, and I'm sure this is no surprise, high training costs uh, combined with low starting salaries can be a disincentive to join uh, the sector. Uh, in aviation, it can cost around $85,000 to become a pilot, a uh, fully trained pilot, but starting salaries can be, you know, as low as, you know, $32,000. Um, there's another uh, set of issues around, um, well, I'll call it aging, diversity and culture. So 28% um, of the transportation and warehousing workforce, workforce overall are over the age of 55, and that's compared to 23% of the total economy. Women represent only 24% of the sector's labor force, and we also see that Indigenous peoples are underrepresented um, in many occupations. And there's also a, a culture question. Um, and again, across the transportation system, there's a, obviously a lack of diversity, somewhat male-dominated culture, um, uh, what can be sort of monotonous work, and extended time away from home can be barriers for, for many people for um, entering, and in particular, underrepresented groups. Um, we also notice that there's you know, regulatory and service-related barriers that can impede people entering the, the um, the sector. Um, of course, many occupations have mandatory certification and licensing requirements. And this, you know, when there's delays in those or, or, or challenges in, in those areas from the you know, government service delivery perspective, this can lead some individuals to delay their entry into the industry or, or cause them to leave entirely for other competing sectors. So Going from there to the to talk a little bit more specifically about the trucking industry. So just mirroring all the, the issues that I that I raised on the previous slide, um, you know we know training costs for for truck driving uh, uh, entry level training can be in the neighborhood of fifteen thousand um, dollars, and and starting salaries are you know again not not that high, and that can be a, we know that can be a disincentive, particularly for some groups that may not you know sort of have the financial ability to, to cover those costs. We know truck driving is an aging labor force, um, and uh, um, we know that you know there's a, uh, kind of a wave of retirements on the on the horizon without as many younger people coming in behind, and and. Um, I think the the experience of the pandemic um, may you know have accelerated uh, some of that some of that retirement, and of course, um, you know, very small number of truck drivers right now are are, are women, and there are negative perceptions about work in the industry, um, including work life balance concerns, um, you know, the sort of uh, concerns around long periods of sitting, um, complex compensation structures, and and you know, uh, work conditions on the road. So. In terms of what we're doing from a Government of Canada perspective, um, there's a number of things that we're, we're trying to do to, to support uh, addressing this challenge. Um, so uh, one of the things that's a fairly you know, recent development is truck drivers are now eligible for Immigration, Refugee and Citizenship Canada's Express Entry Program and have been included, transportation and, and including trucking has been included in the new category-based selection measures um, that the Minister of, of uh, Ministers announced that that will help speed up the immigration process to bring in uh, skilled drivers into Canada. And we're continuing to engage our colleagues uh, in, in IRCC on their uh, review to Canada's immigration policies and programs to, with a view to ensuring the transportation sector is, is reflected in, in those. Um, uh, uh, I won't. I won't spend too much time, but because uh, we're going to, ha we have checking HR here. But um, very pleased that uh, economic, social, uh, economic and social development Canada um, is funding um, uh, trucking HR Canada through the Sectoral Workforce Solutions Program, and they've also been funding some other projects through their Skills and Partnership Fund. 
At Transport Canada, we're working on awareness. We have a job, career, pathway, social media campaign and website to help raise awareness of employment opportunities and encourage Canadians to choose a career in the transportation sector. And we're also working with our provincial territorial colleagues um, under the uh, auspices of the Council of Ministers responsible for transportation and highway safety to try to look at areas for collaboration. So I'll, I'll leave off with uh, what we think are, are I'm calling them forward-looking opportunities. These are things we think can be done in Canada to, again, continue to address this. And these are not assigned to any particular uh, group. They're, this is involving governments, industry, uh, and other stakeholders to work you know, collectively on some of these challenges. So things that we think you know, are good things to look, look at going forward, improving road infrastructure and rest stop infrastructure, um, looking at our training infrastructure, in particular the use of technology um, to help facilitate uh, uh, additional training, um, engagement and awareness and working together to promote um, the use of existing programs uh, to, that the industry can leverage. Um, we want to um, and, and, and work through each other to continue to promote the industry as a great place to work. Um, and. Um, you know, I have regular dialogue and we, we talk regularly with um, colleagues about continuing to ensure that we roll out entry-level training programs um, across all jurisdictions. I know my colleagues here today are all engaged in that activity and, and we hope to, you know, to, to continue to see progress on that level. And that will help with uh, driver license reciprocity and mobility, particularly for newer drivers. So uh, I'm, I'm going to leave it there and I know, I know my colleagues are going to pick up, up on a lot of those themes. On to our next speaker, Craig Fawcett. Craig is the Chief Program Officer for Trucking HR Canada, a national non-for-profit organization dedicated to addressing the human resource challenges and opportunities in the trucking and logistics sector. As a respected leader in HR trucking, uh, Trucking HR Canada works with various associations, government departments, and industry professionals to ensure employers have the skilled workforce needed for today and into the future. As part of the Trucking HR Canada team, Craig oversees Trucking HR Canada projects and programs that aim to help employers meet their industry workforce needs. Welcome, Craig, and over to you. Thanks, Lynn. I really appreciate the opportunity, and I'm really happy uh, uh, to be here today. Um, so before I go into my presentation, I just want to talk a little bit more who Trucking HR Canada is. Thank you for the introduction there. Um, so what we tend to do is we focus into three main areas, two of which I'll talk about in some detail today. We do uh, a lot of labor market research uh, on the labor market within the trucking logistics industry. So I want to present some of that data today that looks at some of the numbers behind some of the persistent labor shortages that we've been facing. We also also do a national occupational standards development, uh, and I've touched on that a little bit, especially as we talk about driver pathways and getting new people into the industry, but we also look at HR best practices as well, um, and we also have different programs and initiatives that in, uh, enable employers and in, uh, in Canadians basically to find trucking as a, as a possible destination for their careers. So I'll first start with some of the labor market information and a little bit of the data and what it's kind of telling us are some of the challenges we've been facing in the, in this, in the immediate past and into the future we may see around those labor shortages. So before we get into that, I'll just give you some kind of context numbers. Um, our industry as a whole employs about 761,000 workers. Uh, this graph here represents that entire workforce uh, over the last year, essentially. And that includes, obviously, the for hire segment, which is the section of trucking that is moving goods for other individuals, but also includes the private fleet side as well. So that's the trucking operations in uh, retail, wholesale trade, construction, resource extractives, um, uh, manufacturing and so on. So we are an industry that, although it's by itself to some extent, also intersects many other industries in Canada. So when we look at our labor market information, we want to look at that as, an, as a totality because uh, if there are truck drivers, you know, in need in construction as there are in trucking, you know, we're pulling from the same pool. So if we want to understand those challenges, we kind of need to see it as a, as a whole number. So our industry as a whole is uh, about 760,000 workers. Of that, about 300. 
and 2,000 are truck drivers. So not a real big surprise here is that trucking uh, or drivers are the backbone to our industry. They represent at any given time between, say, 44 and 46 percent of our entire workforce. So clearly the need to focus on drivers has been a, has been a well warranted uh, endeavor. So when we start to look at some of the uh, shortages within the industry, we are essentially looking at two main metrics that we can look at. One is our vacancy rates, uh, which is uh, put out by StatsCan uh, during their job vacancy and wage surveys that come out quarterly, and it's something that StatsCan has been following since 2015. So this is an indicator of the number of job openings at any given time. Uh, and what we've seen, so it's not necessarily a shortage, because a lot of those jobs will be filled in the next quarter over time, but it's a good indicator of what's happening around labor shortages. So as you can see from this graph here, um, we've basically seen a persistent increase in vacancies within our industry. Uh, basically what we've seen in 2022 is the largest vacancy uh, rate and the largest number of vacancies our industry has ever seen uh, since the beginning of collecting this data in, 2020, in 2015. So right now at the end of 2022, we had about 25,000 vacancies, uh, representing about an 8% uh, rate within the workforce. So it's a significant vacancy. Normally our rates are about the, are the second highest in Canada, next to food and beverage workers, which tends to be a bit higher. So clearly, not necessarily the indicator that you want to lead, uh, but definitely one that we want to take a close look at. Secondly, what we look at is the supply, uh, labor demand supply uh, gap um, calculation as well. So this is essentially looking at uh, the numbers of workers who are working in the industry, the number of workers who are unemployed, uh, along with uh, the, the demand for those workers and so on. So when we look at this number here, at the end of 2022, we actually saw a, uh, a labor supply and demand gap of about 15,000 workers. And what that essentially means is that if we had every employed truck driver along with every unemployed truck driver take on a position, we would still have a gap of about 15,000 workers we would need to train into the industry. So this is, this is more of a true measure of the actual labor supply and uh, demand gap that we have. The one thing that we have to keep in mind, though, with this number is that it's actually a very conservative number, because although it assumes that every unemployed truck driver can find a job, we know that's not necessarily the case. There's um, a lot of frictional reasons that prevent someone from working. It could be that they're not in a jurisdiction or an area that has a lot of jobs at that time. It could be that they're not no longer safe to be on the road, although they call themselves a truck driver, maybe have a license, they may not have a clean CVOR or, and so on that would make them employable. So we actually know that the actual gap in employment or in la that labor gap is actually much higher. So this is what's telling us till the end of 2022, but we do know as well that there's been a lot of uh, movement, especially by the federal government and by the Bank of Canada, to start to essentially cool the economy from around 2021 all the way through to now. And that was meant to obviously address two factors, one, inflation, but two, the rising labor shortage that we're seeing in our sector and other sectors as well. So we wanted to ensure that we included some 2023 numbers and to see what's happening now because we should start to see some effect to that basically. So interestingly enough, our vacancy rates haven't really changed in the first quarter, at least nationally. I know in some provinces there are some differences. Alberta has seen a reduction, for example, but nationally across the board, our vacancies stay in about the same at around 23,000 workers. But when we look at the supply and demand gap, we actually see a little bit of a different change. Definitely labor demand has gone down significantly, so I would suggest in that case, the Bank of Canada's job is working in this, in this situation, has made that kind of difference. But at the same time, we're seeing that labor supply is decreasing too. So although a different initiatives by the federal government can help on that demand side and, and pull levers within the economy, we still have to look at that supply side. As, as much as that demand lessened, so did the exit of workers to our industry. So although uh, we saw that great de uh, decrease in demand, we're still seeing a shortage of about, about 5,000 workers. So yes, that gap came down over that brief period, but we're still seeing a gap, especially with these fairly extreme measures or strong measures taken by the government uh, to lessen that. So as we move forward, though, to the rest of 2023, we are seeing a couple indicators that are basically telling us that uh, the labor market will continue to tighten as well. This graph here looks at the number of employed truck drivers uh, over the past uh, basically five months, and we're seeing now a continual uptick in the, in the amount of employed drivers, which means there'll be a greater um, uh, pressure on, uh, on employers to continue to find drivers who may not be there uh, moving forward. 
Lastly, too, we're starting to see a definite decrease in the number of unemployed truck drivers as well. So this graph here demonstrates that our, our number of unemployed truck drivers are going down, uh, especially with a peak in April to May, it dropped by almost 1.2 per, uh, percentage points, and we're going to probably see a continual loss of that. Even though we're seeing around a 5% uh, unemployment rate, we're getting really close to that frictional level of unemployment where really we don't have an available pool of drivers to pull from. We're always going to see some unemployment exists no matter what as I had mentioned before so we're really getting close to that kind of level uh, that kind of numbers so that's essentially kind of a quick snapshot of what's happening within the labor market. Um, so just a couple kind of conclusions we can draw is that um, early indicators from Q2 of 2023 suggest that the labor market is definitely tightening, and we expect that to continue. We'll see that as more vacancy data comes out for Q2, which will happen later, uh, later on into the fall uh, and as well. Also, we are producing a larger report at this time that will look at uh, labor, mar labor market forecasts uh, up to 2028, so we'll get a better sense of where we see those numbers uh, moving. We know that uh, Transport Canada has some numbers from that as well, but this is a, a maybe a, a bit of a different look at that too that I think will supplement the work that uh, has been happening in other areas. So the next part that I want to talk about is some of the initiatives that we've been taking on and working with uh, various partners to help uh, alleviate some of those uh, labor shortages. So uh, Melanie had mentioned that uh, through the Sectoral Workforce Solutions Program, uh, Truck and HR Canada did receive a large grant, about $46 million, to essentially provide uh, funding for training uh, and onboarding new drivers and other workers in other uh, key occupations within the industry. This has been a really vital and important initiative that uh, is really, I think, is, as you'll see, has had some benefit at least uh, in, the, in the short term. We started this project in October of 2022. It wraps up in March of 2024. Uh, so it's a very short term project, but at the same time, I think it's a given a good shot in the arm. Uh, as well with that program, we've also uh, been working with a lot, a lot of uh, partners on that. Uh, PMTC, uh, the CTA have been two really vital partners on that project. We've been partnering with other provincial trucking associations. I believe in the room uh, represented from AMTA, uh, QTA, and APTA, and a large uh, uh, and a number of other partners. If I miss any partners in this room, I apologize. It's only the people I saw so far today, um, but it's been vital that we've had that uh, buy-in from uh, such a cross-industry uh, uh, representative. Presentation. So the way the project is meant to work is that we provide up to $10,000 as a driver training grant that covers uh, entry-level training uh, for that individual. This has been deemed to be vitally important. What we find is that the cost to enter the industry has been a, a real barrier. We saw that ourselves in some of the youth research that we had done from 2019 and 2020. Uh, and we also know, too, that truck driver training is not necessarily always covered in every jurisdiction uh, through uh, any type of provincial student loan uh, or student or assistance type programs. The one exception obviously is Quebec that is essentially the gold standard on driver training but the rest of Canada still needs to catch up to that in many different ways and this is a good mechanism in between to do so. Secondly, too, that we also provide a wage incentive to the, uh, to the employer who's willing to sponsor that newly trained driver. And the idea of that, of that $10,000 that uh, comes back as um, a reimbursement of wages paid is that it's an opportunity to help offset some of the onboarding costs and the uh, other finishing training that employers have to partake in in order to get that newly uh, trained driver up to being road ready, being able to be insured, uh, especially in a private setting, uh, at, at a reasonable rate. Rate as well. And what we find that that's probably the most important kind of component to this as well. What, when we look at this, when we look at all the different uh, skills and um, competencies within a, to be a truck driver, there's about 500 of those. The first 200 are usually covered through entry level training depending on your jurisdiction. The other 300 tend to fall to the employer to be able to train to that individual. So having an opportunity to provide some incentive towards that has been uh, incredibly important. We also have a number of non-driving wage incentives as well, because we know we have labor shortages in other areas. Melanie had pointed out shippers and receivers. We're seeing a shortage in dispatchers and some of the other occupations. So ensuring that we're bringing on a new workforce in those areas was deemed to be very important too. 
So, so far, as of at least July 11th last week, uh, we've filled about 57% of the driver training grants. So they've either been approved uh, and or completed, and about 82% of the non-driving wage incentives. So that's been a large number we've been able to push through. Uh, we're looking for totals of 1,400 new drivers and 1,200 uh, non-driving wage incentives. So it's been a, a real good push and really something that's been taken up by the industry as a, a valuable mechanism that they can use to onboard new drivers. Interestingly as well, though, we found as a, an, a, an important secondary benefit other than just alleviating the cost of driver training and onboarding new drivers is that we've had an impact on some of the diversity numbers in the industry as well. So these uh, uh, stats here uh, indicate where our industry is at as far as women, visible minorities, and female drivers. So 16% of our industry is women, 22% fall under the visible minority category as defined by StatsCan, and now it's about 4.2% of drivers. This is uh, based upon uh, Census 2021 data that we've just uh, recently analyzed. But when we look at the participants in the Career Expressway program, especially under the Sectoral Workforce Solutions uh, arm of it, 34% of the participants coming through that program are women who are in non-driving roles. 25% represent uh, visible minorities, and 7.4% represent uh, female drivers. So we're seeing that we're making a difference on slowly increasing those numbers. I mean, obviously, this is a drop in the bucket of the overall size of the industry, but it's showing that initiatives like this that can be funded uh, by the federal government or by provincial governments actually has a, a good benefit on uh, diversifying that workforce. We'll see that as well when we look at some of the youth statistics. So about 8.1% of our workforce is 25 years or younger, while about 28% of the uh, grants that we and placements that we've done through the Sector Workforce Solutions Program are 30 and under. It's not a completely comparable statistic. We have to still get some stats campaign on the 30 and under group. We only have 25 and 35, but it does show that we are bringing more youth into the industry and that employers are using this mechanism uh, to bring on that younger driver, the younger individual who wants wants to become a driver. We also have two other programs that we've been running. We have a similar project that has similar wage uh, incentives and driver training grants. That's through the Youth Employment Skills Strategy, which is also funded uh, as another program through ESDC. Through that program, we put th uh, through 619 youth. So that's been a, a really beneficial program. We've actually oversubscribed into that program. We have new funding for this year. Then we're close to reaching our cap in that one. And then we've also been able to bring in almost 1,000, or we will in another week or two, 1,000 placements in the student workplace program. So this is an, an, an initiative that is, again, through ESDC that funds um, or provides a subsidy for employers to bring on a post-secondary student to complete a work-integrated learning opportunity that could be a co-op, a, a work placement, and so on. So again, it's a good opportunity to expose youth to uh, different careers within our industry. So we, we've, we've seen that the, these types of initiatives are actually having a real uh, world impact uh, on not only uh, allowing individuals to be trained as drivers, but at the same time helping us diverse, uh, diversify our workforce. So it's one really strong mechanism that can be in place uh, amongst many others that can help with uh, dealing with some of our labor shortages. So that's uh, basically my presentation, so thank you. Thank you very much, Craig. Okay, our next speaker is Mike Million from Private Motor Truck Council of Canada. Mike began his career in the trucking industry working for a local carrier hauling livestock and bulk agriculture products. Mike moved on and spent five years hauling freight in all 48 U U.S. mainland states and six Canadian provinces. The carrier then opened a certified driver training school in 1998 and Mike became one of the first schools, one of the school's first certified driver trainers. In 2000, Mike transitioned into safety and compliance for the fleet while still working part-time as a trainer at the school. In 2002, Mike became the safety compliance maintenance and training manager for the Hansol District Cooperative, Cooperative's commercial trucking feet, fleet where he oversaw the fleet as it grew from 40 to over 160. In 2015, Mike moved into the Trucking Association business and was named the president of the Private Motor Truck Council of Canada, where he remains today. Welcome, Mike. Over to you. Thanks, Lynn. Um, thanks for having me here uh, today. Excited to be in the, in the great province of, uh, 
Newfoundland, got here four days early and uh, had the opportunity to see a lot of sites and glad I had the opportunity to do that. You have a, an amazing province out here. So uh, I'll get into my presentation quickly. I'm just going to start off by giving a, a quick introduction as to who the, the PMTC is. Uh, so we're a not-for-profit membership-based association and, and you heard Craig talk a little bit about private fleets and dedicated fleets. Uh, about 90% of our membership is private and dedicated fleets, so that's mainly who we, we represent. And most of the numbers I'm going to talk about are going to be on, on private and dedicated fleets and our members. And, and for those that may not know the difference, uh, for hire fleet, somebody who hauls freight uh, for money, and, and a private and dedicated fleet, private fleet is somebody whose main business is something other than trucking, but has a large or small uh, trucking fleet to supply their products or services to their customers. And I said that's who 90% of our, our membership base is, is those private and dedicated fleets. Uh, our membership as a whole, uh, our members operate roughly 17,000 trucks, uh, over 25,000 drivers, and operated over 1 billion kilometers in 2022. Uh, private fleets generally will supply groceries, medicines, blood, fuel for home heat, uh, just a few essential items and, and among other, many other uh, essential and non-essential items. And, and just some general information on the transportation industry. Um, studies will show the trucks move over 70% of the freight value of Canada. I, I generally argue a vehicle probably moves 100% of the freight value of, in Canada because uh, it's got to get from the, uh, the boat or the train or the plane uh, somehow to, to your store or your house and it's, it's going to be moved by a vehicle. Uh, employs over 300,000 drivers as Craig mentioned. Uh, study I'm saying says over 1.2 million people but a lot of that is depending on what you're defining as transportation related. Um, and generated 39.5 billion uh, of revenue in 2018. So that's how important the, the transportation industry is uh, in this country. Uh, this one I'm bringing up, the highway usage, um, just for perspective. So there's, in Canada, country of, we just went over 40 million the other day. Um, oh, we have over 35 million registered vehicles, uh, which is up almost 8% since 2014. A third of all Canadians live in Vancouver, Toronto, and Montreal. Uh, and the 2019 Financial Post report showed on average it was 24 minutes quicker for people to stay in their car in those areas to drive to work than it was to hop on public transit. And, and the reason I bring that up, you may say this isn't labor related, but, but it actually is um, because the workplace of a driver is the roadway. All right? And the more congested our roads are, the more unsafe their workplace is, and it affects how the movement of goods operate and how long it takes the movement of goods to get there. Um, so infrastructure needs, as a rule, have not kept up with how many more vehicles we've added to our roadways in the last nine years, which affect the driver's uh, workplace and their health and safety. Uh, labor needs of private fleets. Um, we keep hearing about driver shortage. Historically, Private fleets have not suffered from a, a labor shortage the same as for hire fleets have. Um, I've been in the private fleet industry either operating a, a fleet or doing this role for roughly 23 years now. And until the last five years, really, most private fleets had a waiting list of drivers to pick from. So one job, one job went, they had a list sitting there of referrals, they'd call them and, they, and they'd get another, another person in to fill the seat. Um, used to be the case, it's not that way anymore. Uh, this began to change prior to COVID um, and only intensified after initial lockdowns ended. And, and there was a few reasons for that. Um, you know, one of the reasons I think private fleets didn't suffer from the shortage as much as a private fleet isn't chasing freight. So when we have an ep economic upturn, uh, people want more goods, they want more products. And generally, if the demand goes up, then the, the for hire fleets are adding to their, to their vehicles and therefore your, your shortage gets higher when you have more demand and more vehicles needed. Uh, whereas the private fleets aren't, aren't moving for higher product, they're moving their own. Um, and also the, the private fleet job in a lot of cases were, were kind of the cream of the crop jobs. Uh, drivers get paid by the hour, we're home the majority of the night. Um, so that is why the, the shortage maybe wasn't quite as much. And to be honest, when you have a peak in Valley, when you have a peak, a lot of private fleets uh, reach out to for hire fleets 
to handle that peak and valley that they need, right? So the, the two industries do work together. In a lot of cases, a private fleet wouldn't add. They'd reach out to their for hire partners to handle that seasonal peak and valley. Uh, but during COVID, um, what we found was because it was harder to find those fleets, uh, private fleets started expanding their own fleet because they were having issues uh, obtaining private fleet or um, uh, obtaining the for hire services to move their freight because that, that capacity wasn't out there. So the private fleet started to expand their own fleets more so they had more control over their product, which then they obviously had trouble getting the, uh, the drivers as well. Um, we do our own benchmarking survey, so even though I said historically the private fleet industry hasn't had an issue obtaining drivers, 94% of our fleets that were surveyed in our 2022 benchmarking survey uh, said their top priority was trying to obtain drivers. So despite what I said, even with all the advantages I just listed that a private fleet may have, it's still the top issue of 94% of the fleets that we surveyed. Uh, the average age, some good news, the average age of the drivers of the fleets that we surveyed was 49.8, and this is the first time it's gone under 50 since 2018. Um, so we can look at that as a bit as a positive, I guess. And, and the last part, which is also another reason why the private fleets generally didn't suffer from the driver shortage as much, the average turnover rate was 9.7% in, in the private fleet. A lot of turnovers that you hear, especially in long haul, is up north than 90%. And obviously, if you're not losing your drivers, um, you don't have to rehire uh, as many. So that was a big, big advantage as well. 78% uh, of private fleets surveyed are home every night. Majority of drivers are paid hourly or by salary in a 51-hour work week um, with the average salary of slightly over 88K. So um, um, I think the pay is generally pretty good in it. But again, even with all these advantages, 94% of them still said obtaining drivers was their biggest, uh, biggest challenge that they had. Some things that we're seeing change. Um, positive news, private fleets almost never hired uh, new people, uh, new operators out of school, because they didn't have to. Uh, in our latest survey, it seems like a, no number, a low number, but 13% of our uh, new hires for our private fleets now are now directly out of a driving school or they're internally upgrading their own staff uh, who maybe want to move out of a warehouse job, safety job, and become a driver role. So that's actually higher than it used to be because it hardly most private fleets, almost all of them would require at least two to three years experience. However, 83% still do come from other trucking fleets and it's almost a split. 42% came from for higher fleets and 41% came from for other private fleets. Um, and more and more of our members until uh, recently, most of our members did not um, reach out and hire temporary foreign workers because they were able to fill their roles with their local population that was uh, around them. Uh, and that's not the case anymore and more and more private fleets are now looking for the either temporary foreign workers or actually what we prefer more is a uh, foreign worker who's looking for permanent path to residency because it isn't, the shortage isn't a temporary issue. We don't need somebody for six months. We need somebody for, uh, for the rest of their career. Um, partnerships that can be made between industry and, and governments to help uh, address some of these needs and, and Melanie uh, touched on it a little bit. But we have entry level training was committed to by all the jurisdictions in February of 2020. Um, three and a half years later, we still have, I believe, four jurisdictions that have not implemented mandatory entry-level training. And there's a bunch of different reasons we can get into for that. Uh, but the bottom line, it is causing issues. And one of the issues it is causing is with reciprocity. So if you have a driver who gets a license in a jurisdiction that doesn't have mandatory entry-level training, and they want to move to a jurisdiction that does have mandatory entry-level training, uh, they cannot move that driver from one jurisdiction to the other and have their license swapped unless they've been driving for at least two years. Uh, if they've been driving for a year or less, they have to take a completely different melt or a new uh, driver training program. And if it's between one year and two years, they have to do a road test. So that is causing mobility issues where most of our members, if they get their license in a jurisdiction that doesn't have melt, we were before they might move them to Ontario, Alberta, or BC, and the individual may want to move. Now they wait two years. They wait till they got their experience to move them. And in some cases, the training schools that they went to, 
the length of their training is actually above and beyond MELT programs, but it still doesn't get uh, put towards an approved program. So there, there's issues with reciprocity that the only way they're going to get addressed is if we all uh, adopt this policy. Um, consider a uh, funding model for driver training. Craig talked about your Career Expressway program. Uh, it's a great program. We're thankful for the federal government for putting it out there as well and the various provincial ones, but, but the issue is these are ad hoc programs. Uh, it, it's not like somebody who goes uh, through for a trade for, for plumbing or electrician where they can get government uh, grants and subsidies and student loans. Because trucking isn't considered a trade, um, you can't get these, these student grants. So generally, unless you have these ad hoc programs, the funding is through unemployment, which to be blunt, doesn't always lead the best candidates coming through because they may not want to come into your industry. They're being training because they're told they're have to. Um, so more consistent funding model is, is needed across the, the region. Uh, jurisdictional uh, inequities need resolved, and it's something we talk about it all the time, and that's one of CCMTA's biggest mandates, right, is to work together with, with provinces and territories and the federal government to find common ground. And, and as much as we have found common ground over the years, there's still things that need to be fixed. Um, the biggest one, um, I always say, is oversight. The, the oversight of our rules and regulations is very lacking. Um, no matter which jurisdiction we're in, whether that's on road enforcement or doing audits inside. Um, rules without enforcement are just suggestions um, because only those that want to follow them will follow them. Rules are created for those that don't want to follow them and unless they're scared of getting caught, they're going to continue not to follow them. And that's one of the biggest things we have to work on uh, is enforcement. Um, the jur jurisdictional inequities, we have to fix them as well, but once we get them fixed, we still need to work on that enforcement. Uh, but what the jurisdictional initiatives do, just to give you an example, and, and I won't name the, the area, but we don't necessarily have the same rules and regs from one province to the other, and it leads to carriers doing what we call jurisdictional shopping, where they'll move one jurisdiction, go to another jurisdiction, and not even have a truck base there, but they know the rules are more lenient, so they get away with it. And I won't say the region, but we had an insurance member of ours did a quick Google search and found over 300 trucks that were from the 300 trucking companies from the greater Toronto area. Um, and he knows they're in the greater Toronto area. We're listed and based out of a different province than Ontario, and they don't have one truck in the province that they're listed in. But they were operating there because insurance was cheaper and the oversight wasn't as strict. So we need, we need to fix that stuff so we can get unsafe carriers off the road and not just move the issue from one region of the country uh, to the next. Uh, national safety rating is, is kind of on the similar front, although the provinces and territories, and we've come up with a, a national safety code to say how we audit carriers to make it similar, it's not the same. And comparing a carrier who operates in Ontario to a carrier who operates in Alberta or BC or Manitoba, you cannot look at the two provincial safety ratings side by side and, and compare them equally because they're not rated the same. They're not scored the same, they're not listed the same. Uh, we work with members in the US who open private fleets up here and the biggest thing that always surprises them, the first thing they'll say when they call me is where do I go to get my fleet's national safety rating? And I'm like, you don't. If you have a fleet in Ontario and you have one in BC and you have one in Alberta, you're gonna have to run all three because we don't have a national system that goes together. Um, so that's something that, that we need to work on to, to bring together into one. And looking at my clock here, I'll wrap up quickly. Um, partnerships between industry and governments to address needs. Temporary foreign workers with a path to permanent residency is something we definitely need, and we're glad to see the expansion on it. But what we have to do is make sure that we the, the provinces and territories and the feds work together closely on this because one thing that doesn't help is when we approve temporary foreign workers to come in and we put them with a fleet who has an unsafe safety record. It doesn't help the fleet, doesn't help the driver, and it doesn't help the image of our industry. Those individuals end up working for a fleet for a short period of time, get a bad introduction to our industry, and then leave our industry. And we have seen cases where they've been approved by one department to work for another one, and the, the company has had safety violation rating issues. They've had, one didn't even have a provincial safety rating, didn't have an NSC number, and one had been fined uh, for unfair labor practices and they still got approvals to get more through. So we need to, we need to tighten that up. 
Uh, and to do that, I say we need an, an approved carrier model in place where carriers are pre-approved based on their, their training systems and what they have in place. Uh, national standard for highway construction for highway main highway routes. Biggest issue we hear in workplace safety is lack of uh, proper rest areas and parking. And the provinces and territories and the feds hopefully can work together to create a standard that's the same no matter where we go. Same for clearing standards. Um, focus on enforcing the underground economy, and that's all I'm going to touch on that because I know Jonathan's going to touch on that uh, a little bit more. Uh, and with that, I will wrap it up. Thank you. Um, our final panelist is Jonathan Blackham from the Canadian Trucking Alliance. Jonathan is the Director of Policy and Public Affairs for both the Canadian Trucking Alliance and the Ontario Trucking Association. Jonathan has been with both organizations for over 10 years and leads several files related to labor, immigration, taxation, and trade. He is also CTA's lead on a number of other government and industry committees, research panels, and advisory boards. Welcome, Jonathan. Over to you. Thanks, Lynn, and, uh, and very happy to be here with everyone to speak on this important topic. Uh, it's a bit of a gift and a curse, I think, going, going last. Um, so I'll try and sort of touch on some of the, the areas, um, or I'll try and stay away from some of the areas that the folks covered here. And when I think about this topic, trucking's labor shortage, it was one of the first issues I really got into when I started in this industry. It was around 2012, 2013. And at that time, CTA was working with the Conference Board of Canada and then later um, a consultancy called CPCS on what was sort of the first reports of the driver shortage uh, in the trucking industry. And, and I, was, I was deeply involved in, in sort of the, the, the numbers at the time on those reports. But what I remember most was the debates around the table. Um, there were a lot of folks saying, oh, the shortage is just being made up. It's not real, that this is some sort of... Um, you know, clever tactics on CTAs or the, or the industry's part for, for whatever purposes. And I think we've come a long way since then. I mean, you've heard the numbers from, uh, from Melanie and from Craig, they're real. But I think more than that, we don't hear that sort of debate anymore. I think people sort of understand that trucking has, uh, has labor shortages in, and has some labor challenges. So from there, I think the question is, okay, you have a problem, what are you doing about it? So there's no, there's no silver bullet to this, this issue. Um, we're not the only industry with, with labor shortages, lots, lots have them. Um, but from our end, you know, we have to take steps to try and be better, to try and address the root issue. These aren't the only four things that are a priority for us or for the industry. They're just four that I'm involved in and, and I think are, are making a difference. So the first is industry image. Um, that's selling the story of trucking to the next generation of potential worker new entrant. Training support, um, both Mike and, and Craig have talked about that as well. Supremely important, both pre-licensing support and on the job support. Immigration has also been mentioned. Something we've made a lot of progress in, but I think we have a lot to still work on in combating the underground economy. Because at the end of the day, as great as we can improve our industry's image or support new entrants in training or get access to talented people from abroad, it's all for nothing if they come into a, into a, a labor market or into an, a, an industry where, where folks are being abused or taken advantage of or aren't enjoying the... Um, the benefits of being being in our industry. So for the first one, for image, I'll have to look at my notes here. I can only kind of see that over there. So in 2021, CTA launched uh, the first phase of our industry image campaign. It was known as the Choose to Truck campaign. It was the largest uh, image branding exercise our, our industry's ever undertaken, um, largely social media focused, um, and to date by all, all measures uh, has been extremely successful, both in terms of the expectations we had 
as an organization for it, um, but also in terms of uh, stacking it up against other industries that have done uh, similar campaigns in their metrics. So to date, nearly 40 million impressions across social media platforms with nearly 1 million click-throughs. Um, and if you follow the process of how the campaign works, you see it, you click through, the final portion of it is to submit your personal information, say, yes, I'm interested in joining the industry, learning more. Um, so we've had over 5,000 people go through the full process and say, hey, I wanna, I wanna get into trucking. The first phase for us was really what we called a hearts and minds exercise. We really wanted to just get out there with our messaging, try and put a new spin on the industry, um, some really aspirational messaging, highlighting the positive things we thought we, we have to, to offer potential job seekers. So we're about to embark on, on phase two, which starts in, in the new year. Um, it's got a whole new look, um, new creative, new videos, all, all that stuff that goes, goes along with it. Um, but this phase is gonna be a lot more centered on the sort of career and recruitment aspect. We're really trying to get more people, yes, it's great they're seeing the messaging online and social media and all that, um, but we're really gonna try and get those click-throughs and those people interested in, in our industry and ultimately lined up with, with employers that we, know, uh, that we know have jobs. Next, uh, training support, something, something my colleagues have, have talked about um, already, and I think Mike picked up on, on an important part. Um, you know, there are a lot of great programs available right now. I mean, Trucking HR Canada has, has the largest one our, our industry's ever seen. It's wonderful. Uh, funded by the federal government, it's putting, you know, it will put thousands of people, will provide support to thousands of people when it's all said and done. But the problem is at some point it will be all said and done. It's, it's funding tied to a specific program that's ultimately tied to political agendas or budgeting, whatever. It can change. We're, we're fortunate in that we're getting more attention now than we have in the past. Um, you know, upgrades and things like our status within the NOC, um, the pandemic, supply chain fragility, all those things have sort of heightened an awareness of the importance of trucking, which is great but it may not last forever. Um, so that's why we are really taking um, at our board level uh, uh, a real close look at what we think we need for the future here. Um, and, and what it seems that folks really want to see is institutionalized, predictable, budgeted funding. It doesn't necessarily need to be 50 million or 100 million or, or whatever, but something available to support those that truly want to get into our, our industry. So in that respect, um, you know, the Quebec trucking school was, trucking schools were, were mentioned earlier. Also something that comes up quite a bit in, in our discussions too, as something that um, is, is predictable and produces high quality new entrants and, and all of that. So again, those are the types of, of things that we're really spending a lot of time talking about right now and things I think you'll hear more from, from CTA on over the next year or so. When it comes to, to immigration, for a long time, uh, temporary foreign worker program was, was really the only game in town. There were some, some other regional programs that, that were out there, um, but that seemed to be the one that, that was really available to, to our sector. Um, more recently, Express Entry has come online as a result of the upgrades in NOC. Um, trucking went from the old NOC C classification, which was the lowest category and, and basically qualified for nothing as far as government programs were concerned. Now we find ourselves in, in tier three, a much better position, allowed us entry into things like, again, Express Entry, which is fantastic. Um, you know, we were, I was actually there with the minister when he announced um, the, the industry's entry into that program. It was very exciting for, for me and for us. But even as that was happening, we knew that there was issues. We knew that it wasn't a perfect match. And part of the issue with that program is within the pointing system, trucking doesn't rank very high. 
Um, the system itself, uh, it's complicated, but it provides a lot of points for post-secondary degrees and particularly advanced post-secondary degrees. So in this, truck drivers were highly unlikely to ever really be selected um, when ranked against some of these other occupations. So that's when uh, we, and, and I know other groups up here as well, my folks also made submissions where we really push for entry into category-based selection, which is sort of a prioritization of in-demand um, in demand streams or in-demand jobs uh, that could be sort of elevated in the ranking process, which is fantastic. Supremely thankful for that announcement. It came about uh, two or three weeks ago, which is fantastic. It gives trucking a fighting shot within um, what is arguably the, the signature economic immigration program in this, in this country. However, again, it's the same issue with the training. It's subject to political priorities. Things can change. Uh, jobs can come in vogue and out of vogue. Different, different occupations can be selected for the category. So what we're calling for here is really a review of the pointing system itself. Now, from my perspective, I would say that there are deep inherent selection biases within it that show preference for certain types of credentials over others. And I think the question we need to ask ourselves in these types of programs, especially economic immigration programs, is are they meeting the needs of what we actually need in the economy? I don't want to to offend anybody here, but just, just a thought exercise. You know, if we take, for instance, uh, a university professor, um, I studied political science and, and philosophy, so let's say a philosophy professor. There's a philosophy professor with a PhD wants to come to Canada. There's also a nurse, a uh, personal support worker with expertise in uh, aging populations and a truck driver. The philosophy professor with their PhD will far outrank the others. I would argue that the other three are more valuable to the economy, to the economic needs we have in this country right now. Again, my personal opinion, but it's an argument that we're trying to advance within these government programs that sort of have always valued that, oh, it's all about the university degrees, it's all about the university degrees. Well, Maybe it's not. Maybe that's not what some of these programs need to, to be prioritizing. So, again, happy to see those wheels starting to turn and that recognition starting to turn. And finally, training support. You know, we're going to have more people coming in through the immigration channels, which is fantastic. The industry absolutely needs it. But when we look at the sort of training supports that are out there, a lot of them are only eligible for those with permanent residency and citizenship already, um, which is the case for some, uh, but not all, especially those coming through with different types of work visas and things. So I think that there's an opportunity there to sort of better match the funding available um, for new entrants. And, you know, I know it is taxpayers' money and maybe that's a, that's a hang-up here for governments. I, I don't know. That would be my guess. Um, but as Mike said, we don't need people on a temporary basis. We need people here for the long haul. So if we, if we agree that, you know, these entrants are going to be in the industry for a long time, then I think that that's also a barrier that, that we should look to, to reduce. And finally, um, combating the underground economy. Mike mentioned this uh, briefly. Uh, I won't harp on it too much, although it is a topic close to me and one I could talk about for, for hours. Uh, we call it Driver Inc. It's, for those who are unfamiliar, it's exactly what it sounds like. It's drivers incorporating themselves, um, which is where the, the name comes from. And really what this is, is a misclassification scheme um, that's designed to strip workers of their labor rights. Um, and it puts them in a precarious tax position as well. And, you know, I, I know lots of you are familiar with, with the trucking industry. I mean, you, you work in this, this too. There are employees and there are owner-operators. We're not talking about owner-operators here. We're talking about people who carriers are saying are independent contractors but do not even come close in any world to passing the independence test. They are employees in every way, except for the fact that the, the, the carrier is saying they're not. 
And the reason why the carrier does this is to pocket on all of the savings associated with traditional employment, overtime, vacation pay, severance, 10 paid sick days, which is a big, big topic for, for a big priority issue for the federal government. These are all things that these people are not getting. And when you add them all up, it's 10, 20, 30,000 per driver in savings per year. So even for a modest fleet, you can easily get to millions of dollars of, of pocketed um, gains through this, this scheme. It strips workers of their rights and it leaves them in a precarious tax position, often not filing properly as they should be. The company's not withholding their income tax for them like a traditional employee puts them in a very precarious position. It's an issue that all levels of government have a hand in helping to fix. Um, federally, ESDC, Canada Labour Code, all the, all the things that all workers in our, our sector should be getting. The CRA, again, the precarious tax position, we estimate about a billion dollars in lost tax revenue per year for this scheme. Um, if you talk to some of my colleagues, the numbers, I mean, the numbers just two, three, four billion, easy. We like to say a billion because we know we can defend that. Um, provincially, WCB, so workers' compensation boards, often the premiums aren't being paid by employers on, on these folks as well. Another way they shed costs, ministries of labor, uh, for those that are provincially regulated, the, the, provincial, um, employ or, uh, the provincial employment standards often aren't being followed. Transportation authorities, of course, um, involved in this, you know, We've done a lot of work ourselves on this sort of looking at the fleets that we know have been um, levied through the Ontario WSIB. We can see, see the lists and, and when we look at the gross violators, uh, maybe not a surprise to you folks, but gross safety and on-road violations as well. And, you know, I think intuitively that probably makes sense to you as well. You know, if you're willing to cut corners on safety, you're willing to cut corners on labor, you're willing to cut corners on all of this. And when you do that, it leads to poor on-road uh, performance. So that, uh, that connection is absolutely there and, and we've done a lot of work making it. Um, and finally, supply chain and other actors. Um, often what happens with these companies through these ill-gotten gains is they'll under, undercut the marketplace and they're winning uh, more and more share of the market. Um, and what is, is troubling about that is fleets that are doing the right thing. They have uh, retirement plans, benefits, good wages, sick days, all the things that we would hope our employers provide for us are increasingly finding it difficult to compete with these companies that have a 10, 20, 30% price advantage on them out there in the market. And it's, it's unfortunate we see it with large Fortune 500 companies, but what's even worse is we also see it with crown corporations and others within the supply chain um, looking for, for bottom of the barrel pricing and, and often it's coming along with a lot of, a lot of this with it. So um, an issue we all have a stake in, um, one that's fundamental to, to the longevity and the prosperity of our industry because at the end of the day, all the gains we can make in image, training, bringing talented people from around the world here, it's all for nothing if we then just place them into, uh, into a, a sector that's, that's ruled by the underground economy where no one's playing by the rules and everybody's being cheated. So um, for me, a supremely important issue and, and one that I think we're, we're starting to make progress on, but we still have, have a long way to go. Um, so with that, again, not all the areas CTA is working on, but, but four that I'm involved in and, and four I'm certainly happy to, to talk about. Thank you very much and thank you panel for a very interesting and informative session. So I'd also like to thank you the participants for joining us this afternoon. Now we're headed into a break for about 30 minutes and we're back here with the last presentation of the day.